artificial intelligence will completely transform our world. But what is AI? Why will it affect you? And how can you and your business survive and thrive through the AI revolution? Welcome to AI and You. Here is your host, author, speaker, and futurist, Peter Scott. Hello and welcome to episode 175. As I said last week, this week's episode is focusing on education. And this is a topic that is deeply personal to me because I have two daughters, ages 9 and 13. And so you can bet that I am heavily concerned with the question of their current and future education. So this is very personal to me and something that I get asked about a lot and think about a lot. One of the ways that things have changed, of course, since I was in school <coughs> years ago, is that horizons have shrunk dramatically in terms of what we can predict. When I was in high school, I would say that most professions, you could predict their trajectories for the next 20 years or so, and so the teachers could prepare us to enter those professions and what we would need to do to make careers out of them. Now I would suggest that the equivalent figure for, again, most professions is more like five years. Again, that's, of course, an average in both cases. And in some cases, there will be jobs that don't exist next year and others will be relatively untraveled for some time. One of the most rewarding things I get to do is when I speak to schools. And that's because of the energy that the students have, the optimism that they universally radiate even, if not especially, when they're presented a fully unvarnished view of the risks that AI poses up to and including extinction. Faculty members, by and large, have a much harder time with that, and it frightens them. But by and large, the students are clear-eyed and raring to get engaged with this topic. So you can see why I really enjoy speaking with them. I think if we're looking at higher education, like the post-secondary level, my view of that from being near to that has always been tinged by some older and perhaps unrequited desires to be engaged there in some official capacity. I started doing a PhD years ago, but life intervened and put that on indefinite hold. But also, whenever someone in my circle who is in that uh, sector lifts the curtain so I can see how the sausages are being made over there. I rapidly count my blessings for being where I am. The amount of politics involved in those institutions is, in retrospect, not surprising, but still depressing. It's not to say that there isn't some way of negotiating those hazards and still remaining a whole person. And I've had plenty of people on the show from those echelons of academia who have dealt with those systemic flaws successfully, but maybe I always wanted it to match the ideals that I'd built up through consuming fiction and stories about Einstein and other sources of the archetypal professor who sits and thinks unhurriedly until genius does its work, and then he or she reveals their breakthrough in the next graduate seminar. It was a bummer to have that bubble burst. But some of the accounts that I've gotten from the horses' mouths of colleagues in post-secondary education have been of an institution that is irrevocably hidebound, mired in politics, incapable of self-reflection or at least of acting on the flaws that they see when they look in the mirror. An institution that's coasting on a hundred-year-old pedagogical model that couldn't pivot to the new era if its life depended on it. And I think it's no exaggeration to say at this point that its life does depend on pivoting. Granted, it might continue to be propped up by fundraising that's equally stuck in the past, but in that case, the lives that will be lost in the near term are those of the students who need to come out of their four years, able to deal with a world that's radically different from the one that prevailed when they entered those hallowed halls, and yet are unprepared for the new reality. So let's bring this down to earth for a bit and talk about ChatGPT. Of course, one of the first uses that it was put to 
within days, if not hours, was answering term paper questions, and it turned out to be exceptionally good at that. By the time teachers found out about ChatGPT, students had been using it for enough time to get quite expert at it, and some of them even wrote blogs about how they had been doing so, and uh, their teachers were catching up from being relatively far behind. Now, when we consider the design of ChatGPT and large language models, it's not surprising that they are so good at answering term papers. They will have had all kinds of examples of term papers and their corresponding subject matter in their training data sets. And so even though the internals of one of these large language models does have no concept of knowledge or facts or even truth, it's only based on what text is most likely to follow next. When you have that much data about the subject matter in your training data, then it's no surprise that it's going to generate an excellent answer. And as the models were refined, they only got better at doing this. Chat GPT, as I recall, passed the bar exam, but when GPT-4 came out, it scored in the top 10% of the bar exam. On standard test after standardized test, it would score similarly, up to the 99th percentile on the graduate record examination, or GRE verbal test. On the other hand, only the 54th percentile on the GRE writing test. And just pause to reflect for a moment on how I said it was only scoring the 54th percentile on something that more than a year ago we would have taken as being an, a sign, a marker of artificial general intelligence. How we do like to shift the goalposts. So let's use the bar exam as an archetype, a proxy for the whole field of standardized assessment. Does this mean that we can give GPT-4 the job of being a lawyer? This is the big question. If the job of being a lawyer means doing the kind of tasks that are in the bar exam, then the answer is, of course, yes. And as we go through this example for bar exam and lawyer, substitute, whatever other field is of greater interest to you. Of course, ChatGPT can't argue in front of a jury. And that's where people inevitably land when looking at the impact of generative AI on the law profession, initially. We nearly had that happen, though. Earlier this year, Joshua Browder, the CEO of Do Not Pay, was going to have a robot, by which I believe he meant a chatbot, represent someone in a U.S courtroom in a traffic ticket case by telling the defendant what to say. You may have heard of Browder before he created Do Not Pay to make AI available to people to create the kinds of responses that would help them fight parking tickets and similar offenses without paying lawyer fees they couldn't afford. Unfortunately, in this case, the state bar threatened to jail him for six months if he used a chatbot lawyer in a physical courtroom. Uh, it certainly seems to me that this is more of a protectionist reaction by the law industry than anything that has indigent defendants' interests at heart. Okay, but let's leave that aside for now and stipulate for the time being that arguing in court is an act that's out of bounds for AI for whatever reason. Okay, what are the other sides to being a lawyer? Their time in court is a small fraction of their total time on the job. Insert joke about actual versus billable hours here. Of the rest, there's a lot of grunt work, like research and discovery, that gets handed off to the junior members. If you want to become a senior member and get to argue in court, you have to start out by being a junior member, which has traditionally involved reading huge piles of documents and sweating over a LexisNexis terminal. If that work can be done by ChatGPT, and I see no reason why the proportion of that type of work that can be done by a large language model shouldn't asymptotically tend towards 100%, then it may superficially appear that the law profession was undamaged by AI, if all you see is what happens in the courtroom. But it's a very different story back in the law office behind closed doors. There have already been hiccups on the way to that from people who didn't know what they were doing. Of course, there was the lawyer 
who used ChatGPT to generate a filing, and he just passed on what it generated to the court. I believe that industry invented the term due diligence. Um, and the other side eventually discovered that the precedents that it cited were completely made up. The offending law firm said in its defense, quote, we made a good faith mistake in failing to believe that a piece of technology could be making up cases out of whole cloth, end quote, which is sort of pleading not guilty by reason of stupidity, Your Honor. So I've clumsily partitioned the job of lawyer into things that can be done by chat GPT and things that probably won't be for some time, although given how good large language models are at constructing language, the moment one is allowed to argue in court will probably be a watershed moment. But this episode is about education, which in this case would mean law school. If chat GPT can pass the bar exam ahead of 90% of humans, it's of paramount importance to know whether the bar is testing for the right thing. Some bar exam questions present a fictitious case and ask the candidate to write the appropriate filing. Others present a scenario in a paragraph and ask a multiple choice question on a point of law. Now, these types of question test the familiarity of the candidate with state law. The only way a human can pass that test unaided is by having a sufficient degree of familiarity to practice law adequately. In much the same way that a human that can play a championship level chess game has a guaranteed level of general intelligence. A computer that can do that does not. So a human cannot cheat on the bar exam by, say, memorizing every possible answer and regurgitating the right one without any understanding of the law. The questions are just different every time. They're different enough to defeat any such strategy. Chat GPT, of course, is approaching this entirely differently. It doesn't have an understanding of law principles the way humans do, but it has read so much law text that when asked, what is the text most likely to answer this question? That answer happens to be the best one enough of the time to beat 90% of humans ask the same question. Now, we need to decide whether that's good enough for Chat GPT to act in a law office. And because this is information work and because what lawyers are doing outside of the Perry Mason bit in front of the jury is precisely the kind of problem solving demonstrated in the bar exam questions, the answer is yes. Well, that might sound like a facile point. Like, duh, what did you expect? But we get a different answer if we look at, say, the medical profession or sports coaching to become one of those typically involves passing a written test, but there's far more to those jobs than what can be adequately captured in text. If you're training to be a registered massage therapist, that's going to depend heavily on what you do to an actual person in front of you in some kind of hands-on, literally, test, and only to a lesser extent on memorizing names of muscles. The question we need to ask about assessment is, are we still measuring the right thing? If ChatGPT can pass that assessment instrument, does that mean that someone who is in the job it's assessing for will be able to perform their tasks faster by using ChatGPT? Or knowledge workers, the answer in general will assuredly be yes. Someone whose job involves summarizing reports or generating novel designs or some kind of acrobatics with Excel spreadsheets is certainly going to maximize the extent to which ChatGPT can save them time. Basic human nature. There have even been reports of people using ChatGPT to hold down four full-time jobs at once, which, if that's accurate and sustainable, tells me that there's a lot of grunt work out there involving what I would call menial information processing, if someone can get ChatGPT to do that much of it. Now, the proportion of my job that can be done by ChatGPT is so far vanishingly small, but that's an atypical sort of job. Apparently, given the things that I'm reading about other people using ChatGPT and theirs. If, therefore, students are going to enter a world where people are already using ChatGPT for 80% of their work, you'd expect that their schools would realize that they have to A, train them to be as capable as possible at using ChatGPT and its successes, and B, assess them on different criteria than the kinds of tasks that people are performing with ChatGPT anyway. And yet, that's not what we've seen. 
the immediate reaction in most quarters was to ban the use of ChatGPT in class. New York public schools, Seattle public schools, Los Angeles Unified School District, the country of Australia, or at least until 2024, how does that prohibition help kids use a tool that's going to be required for competing in the job market? It's like teaching computer science with pencils and paper and not letting them actually touch a computer. Yes, I know, in the space of a couple of weeks, the way that students have been assessed for the last 150 years was basically voided. And that made life very hard for educators. You have my sympathy. But you know, if you can't demonstrate the ability to pivot in response to disruption while optimizing the way that you prepare students for the future, then what's the point? Why are you in business? Isn't this the sort of thing that they need to know? They must learn from you if you're in that role with respect to them. That's what you're there for. Just because the way you assess students hasn't been challenged in 150 years doesn't mean you should just try to throw a monkey wrench in the spokes of progress to keep things the way they've always been. Yeah, that was pretty strident. Unfair to many educators, some of whom I know personally, who are doing their best to do the right thing. But too much of the system is just seized up and in desperate need of a defibrillator shock. And to that part of the system, I want to say, get out of the way. Your students have probably mastered this new AI much better than you have. Now, it's still true that a student that can pass a standardized test has the capabilities that the test is assessing. So the test may continue to be useful if what this tells you is that the student has abilities that aren't nullified by the use of a large language model. But of course, now we have the problem of wondering whether the student used ChatGPT to pass the test, which is why some teachers decided to move their tests from take-home versions into an environment where proctors could monitor students for their use of unauthorized assistance. Obviously, this is expensive and time-consuming, so many teachers would rather find a way to verify whether homework was done by ChatGPT. Something perhaps objective, a tool. Unfortunately, this is really hard to do, and not made any easier by the fact that since there are obviously so many demands for such a service, there are any number of people willing to claim that they can do it. But the results of passing text through AI detection programs are, in every case I'm aware of, so poor as to be unusable including one such tool from OpenAI itself. Now, in news back in May, one teacher didn't even use any of those tools and just gave students submissions to ChatGPT and asked if it had written them. Of course, ChatGPT isn't designed or advertised to do that. The professor at Texas A&M Commerce failed more than half his class, and Rolling Stone reported that diplomas were withheld. Even after the students supplied timestamps on the Google documents they submitted that would show that it was at least very unlikely that AI was used, the professor commented in the school's grading software system, I don't grade AI bullshit. So the idea that education can carry on with business as usual by patching in some kind of AI detector is a non-starter. Since we're talking about text, which has a low amount of noise, even if a detector did start getting good results, I would expect techniques to defeat it to be trivial, including the possibility of just feeding the text to chat GPT and asking it to alter it in certain ways. AI detectors usually analyze something called perplexity, which measures the complexity of text, and burstiness, which compares the variations between sentences. Humans tend to have more perplexity and burstiness than AI, which is really good at imitating humans in an average, smooth kind of output way. But if you explain to ChatGPT what perplexity and burstiness are, and say that you want plenty of each in the text it comes up with, it does exactly that. This is an arms race that just can't be won. Give it up. So what should the future of education look like? Well, first, to pivot to an AI-first pedagogy, by which I mean... Look, for one thing, ChatGPT in the right hands amounts to having an infinite supply of teaching assistants available 24 by 7. What would that cost you? What is it worth to you? Don't argue from exception that you've found X or Y case where ChatGPT isn't able to do that job properly. Look at how many cases where it can do it. Second, to eat the dog food and bring AI in-house wherever it makes sense. Use AI to save costs and time in the back office from figuring out class schedules to providing student support chatbots with a fully integrated student support system, the admin office phone could answer on the first ring day or night and be able to scale up 
effortlessly to handle exponentially higher loads when some kind of crisis occurs, like an active shooter on campus, or something that you didn't anticipate in the policy handbook. I've got at least a dozen other examples of AI saving operational costs in education in the notes I have from prior presentations I've given. Third, reassess what students need to learn, top to bottom and bottom to top. If they're entering a world where large language models will routinely perform tasks that you're now training them for, take that time and put it into something more useful. We no longer teach students how to shoe horses to get around town or to sharpen their own plows or quill pens or repair their own shoes. And we don't teach advanced arithmetic in a world where the answer to that kind of question is in your pocket or on the wall. Siri, what's the square root of 34? I learned how to take square roots with pencil and paper in school and even cube roots. Mercifully, I no longer remember how to do that, so hopefully those neurons are being used for something more productive now. Does anyone want to argue that we should still be doing that? Because often people will argue that we, collectively, humans, will forget how to do some important task and the human race will be left without anyone who can read a paper map, for instance. That simply hasn't been true. There are still people who make artisanal shoes, who do calligraphy with quill pens, and who have mastered the algorithms that computers use to calculate square roots. And in many cases, they're doing that because that's fun. They just aren't a majority of the population, but they don't need to be any longer. There are enough of them. The large language models, and now their multimodal descendants, seriously, if you haven't tried out the image upload feature in GPT-4 or its advanced data analysis mode where it will write and execute code to answer a calculation kind of question, take a look at it. These are doing what I called in my book dinocognesis, word I made up, the process of applying power to thinking. Of course, there are ways that they are imperfect, inadequate, and even dangerous, but while we need to address those, don't take those exceptions as an excuse to ignore all the ways that the models are presenting us with a historic opportunity to up our game. If you're in education and that doesn't excite you, maybe you should be doing something else. If it does excite you, drop me a line at peter at humancusp.com and tell me how you're changing things up. As I said at the beginning, my favorite audiences are kids. All levels, especially high school and early college years. But I, I love kindergarten on up. There is something to say to all of them. A couple of weeks ago, I was speaking to one of the United World Colleges, the Lester B. Pearson College of the Pacific, an institution that teaches the International Baccalaureate to 150 or so kids who have come from all over the world. And it was a wonderful experience for me because they engaged so enthusiastically with the material and the challenges I gave them and kept talking with me long after my presentation. They exemplify how cooperation and collaboration can transcend national borders and racial lines. At the cafeteria afterwards, I was at a table with one student each from South Sudan, Scotland, Canada, Germany, New Zealand, England, and Nepal. And the way they worked together was as frictionless and respectful as you could possibly imagine. Even though we're turning over to them a world that we have messed up in so many ways, I am quite confident that they are the best people to fix it, and I want them to get that chance as soon as possible. That's part of the message that I bring to that age group when I speak to them. So if you've got some students that you would like me to engage with, please, please drop me a line. In today's news ripped from the headlines about AI, a team of AI scientists at Microsoft published a research paper claiming that the OpenAI language model shows sparks, in quotes, of human-level intelligence or artificial general intelligence. For computer scientist researchers to say such a thing is a big deal, okay? They have traditionally been allergic to approaching the AGI question. Now, as we know, there are no good and certainly not universally accepted, let alone understood, definitions of artificial general intelligence. So the most we could hope for at this point would be something that claims there are sparks, and that's what these people are saying. Of course, you can't claim that it's intelligent on the inside the same way that people are intelligent on the inside. But then, and this is where Turing came up with the Turing test, all we have to go on in either the case of machines or humans is what they show to the outside. And this is where the research paper says the same thing in academic language. Quote, our study of GPT-4 is entirely phenomenological. 
We have focused on the surprising things that GPT-4 can do, but we do not address the fundamental questions of why and how it achieves such remarkable intelligence. How does it reason, plan, and create? Why does it exhibit such general and flexible intelligence when it is at its core merely the combination of simple algorithmic components, gradient descent, and large-scale transformers with extremely large amounts of data? These questions are part of the mystery and fascination of large language models, which challenge our understanding of learning and cognition, fuel our curiosity, and motivate deeper research. End quotes. Wonderful way to put it. And so we're now starting to get academic acceptance of there being some kind of intersection with today's AI and artificial general intelligence, that we're approaching that. It's on the board now, whereas before it was beneath consideration. This can only accelerate. The researchers say as much in the paper when they say that GPT-4 is only a first step towards a series of increasingly generally intelligent systems. So we will arrive at general artificial intelligence or artificial general intelligence piecemeal, gradually. Not in a Hollywood-style Big Bang with something hatched out of a research lab that suddenly is unleashed upon the world to mayhem or nirvana. Next week, my guest will be Bart Selman, professor of computer science at Cornell University, whose research focuses on the changing role of AI in society and the risks of advanced AI. That's next week on AI and You. Until then, remember, no matter how much computers learn how to do, it's how we come together as humans that matters. That's all for this episode of AI and You. Please leave a rating and comment and share with your friends. Get the book Artificial Intelligence and You and see more videos and articles at AIandYou.net. That's A-I-A-N-D-Y-O-U dot net, where you can also send us your questions. Thank you for listening.